Well, good morning and welcome to True Grace. Hey, would you stand with me as we worship this morning? Darkness run for cover But the miracle that I just can't get over My name is registered in heaven I believe in signs and wonders I have resurrection power Still the miracle that I just can't get over My name Registered in heaven, my praise belongs to you forever. This is my testimony from death to life. Cause grace rewrote my story. I'll testify by Jesus Christ the righteous. I'm justified. This is my testimony. This is my testimony. Their sons and daughters Bought with blood and washed in water Sing the praises of the Spirit, Son and Father Our God will finish what He started Our God will finish what He started This is my testimony From death to life Cause grace rewrote my story I'll testify By Jesus Christ the righteous I'm justified This is my testimony This is my testimony If I'm not dead and you're not done Greater things are still to come Oh, I believe If I'm not dead and you're not done Greater things are still to come Oh, I believe If I'm not dead and you're not done Greater things are still to come I'm not dead and you're not done, you're not done. Greater things are still to come. Oh, I believe. Oh, this is my testimony from death to life. Cause grace rewrote my story. I'll testify by Jesus Christ the righteous. I'm justified. This is my testimony. Oh, this is my testimony. From death to life. Cause grace rewrote my story. I'll testify. By Jesus Christ the righteous. I'm justified. This is my testimony. This is my testimony. Louder than the unbelief 
important is it that in the ups and downs of this life that we have a firm foundation and anchor to hold on to in Jesus. Amen. And there are ups and downs and there are times when your life feels like it's glorious and times when it feels like you've just been wiped out. And I love that we can come to the Lord during those times. One of the core values in our church is opportunities to meet with God. We like to just open up this, uh, as we continue to sing the next song, just invite people to come to the altar. There's no push or pull or drag. You know, I'm not trying to coerce anybody. I respect you and your decision making. 
Maybe you're here today and you are leaning into Jesus. Maybe you're pressing into God during a really good time and you just want to honor him or maybe you have a need in your life and you want to go to the altar and say, Lord, I need to press into you. I need to lean into you. Uh, this is an opportunity, if you'd like to take it, just to press into God, to meet with God. And after this song, we're all going to pray together. But if you're really um, just needing a touch from God or pressing into God, would you just make your way now to the altar? You can stand. You can kneel. It doesn't matter. If there's too many people, you're up the aisle. That's fine. Let's just press into God and tell him that we need him. Lean into him as we worship together. So if you'd like to worship down here, you're welcome. All right.
as we go to God in prayer today, can I invite you maybe just to say, Lord, there is room in my life for you. Not only that, I want you in my life. I invite you into my life. And I want your way in my life because I believe that your ways are higher than mine. Can we maybe just take a moment before we pray? Just, just let God know, Lord, we want you in our lives. Lord, you're not a bother. We're not trying to be our own God and make a little room for you. You're God. We're not God. We don't want to make all the decisions and provide for ourselves. We, we didn't create anyone. Lord, we, we haven't died on the cross for the sins of the world. We want you to do your job. We don't want your role. Lord, be our leader, be our forgiver, be our Lord and our Savior. And Lord, today, God, we just want to make sure that you know you are more than welcome. I covet, I, I, I desire your presence. I want to hear your voice. I want to know you in a real way. Lord, as we gather together, Lord, there's always many needs on our hearts, many thoughts on our minds. Lord, as we gather together, Lord, for those who are just dealing, God, with the process of aging and they don't like it, they despise it, it's causing trouble for them in their own body or for someone they love. God, give them mercy. Give them grace, grace for the, another person. And Lord, grace for themselves as they walk through a very difficult time of life. God, for those of us that are here today, God, and we've just taken a new step of dependency on you, that we are depending on you for life every day. It used to be I was trying to follow you, but now I depend on you for every single day, fully devoted. Like, God, I, I need you today. And tomorrow when I get up, I'm going to press in because I need you. Lord, help us to live that fully devoted, fully dependent life in you, asking for your presence. God, for that person who's here today, God, and their, their faith is strong. Lord, that they, they just feel healthy and strong and, and vibrant. God, Lord, I just pray, Lord, you just fan that flame and let their ministry to others be powerful. Give them a boldness, God. Give them, Lord, uh, just a favor. Give them blessing everywhere they go, God, that they might be used mightily for you. God, we just thank you, Lord, for this city that we live in. Lord, it's not a place that's known for incredible churches and the love of God. Lord, there is much heartache. There is homelessness. There is addictions, God. There is, there, there is trafficking, God, up and down the I-5 corridor. There's many who would say there is no God and perhaps even make fun of the God of the Bible. And Lord, we just pray today, God, that you would be God of the city. Lord, you are certainly the Lord of this church, but you are also the Lord of this city. And God, we pray, Lord, that you just bless other churches, that you'd reach in, God, to all the suffering, God, right around this area. And God, you would bring supernatural, sovereign move of God help to people in their apartments by themselves. Lord, that people would have dreams about you, God, that people would have incredible God moments and they would be delivered and they would find hope and help in life again. God, thank you for your presence. Thank you for your power. Thank you, God, for just people who are striving to love God and live for God. Lord, there's so many things we cannot control. But we can control if we will try to live for you. And we've made that decision. I want to live for you. I want to know you. God, I pray, Lord, that you would be close to the brokenhearted today. And, Lord, that you would have your hand upon our lives. Lord, we honor you. We press into you. We need you. We're not trying to do life without you. We want you to lead our lives. So, God, thank you for being here and loving us today. In Jesus' name. And everybody said. Amen. Amen. Thanks for pressing into God and really just uh, being a, a man or woman of prayer and also of worship. It's phenomenal. Some of you are greeting somebody right now. I didn't say to do that yet. All right. So thanks for being a friendly church. Uh, would you reach out and say hi to someone nearby? Find four or five people you haven't met yet. All right. Good morning. If this is your first time here, I just want to extend an extra welcome to you. We're so glad that you're here. On the seat back in front of you is a next step card. We just ask that you fill that out, take it out the double doors to guest services, and a friendly face will be there to exchange it for a gift, as well as answer any questions you may have. If you're joining us online, feel free to hop onto the website. There's a next step card there, and someone will reach out to you and get connected with you. We have some exciting things going on. Child dedication is going to be this coming Mother's Day. And what child dedication is, it's just an opportunity to go before the church and before God and say that I've made the choice to raise my child with the Lord. 
and what that means is being an example of what it looks like to be a Jesus follower. So if you'd like to dedicate your child, go ahead and go to our website and under the events page you can get registered for that. We also have our women's conference May 19th and 20th, and I am so excited for this event. It's one of my favorite that we do every year, and this year's theme is She is Courageous. And I think it's just gonna be a great opportunity as personally a working mom and wife that I get this intentional time to come to church and to be away from the dirty laundry and the dishes that often distract me and just fully focus on the Lord, building relationships with other women, the opportunity for worship, and just to grow in my relationship with the Lord. So I hope you'll join me and hop on our website to get registered for that. Lastly, we have uh, the opportunity here at True Grace that we actually partner with Northwest University, which is an accredited program to be able to get your associates, your bachelors, and even your masters in some subjects, and for a third of the cost, which is incredible. Rather than going on campus, the flexibility of doing online classes, so if you're an adult, recently graduated from high school, you have that flexibility to do it online. We're gonna have an informational meeting uh, here on May 7th at True Grace after the second gathering in room 205. So hope to see you there. Good morning, True Grace. How are you today? Oh, it's so good to be there here with all of you. Don't you feel like you've been in church already? It's like a good service. The presence of God's been in here and it's been great. Uh, buckle up because there's more to come. There's more to come. We have a guest speaker today. Uh, um, uh, uh, Micah Kruger is here from Pasco, Washington, the pastor in Pasco, Washington. He's been our speaker at Man Camp, and he's going to bring the word today, so we're excited about that. But I've, I'm here to talk a little bit about uh, giving. Talk a little bit about giving. How many of you have a relationship with something that uh, there's not a lot of trust in the relationship? Not a lot of trust in the relationship. Anybody out there? Yeah, yeah. I, I've had a couple relationships like that. When I was 15 years old, I was given my first car. And it was my grandfather. He was like six. He loved small cars, but he was a big man. He was like 6'3". And he gave me his first car. He was coming to the end of his driving life. And, uh, and I was the next grandkid to start driving. And so before I was... 16, he gave me his convertible Volkswagen Carmagia. Yeah, it was amazing. And I remember it was in Renton, Washington, and I lived in Eastern Washington. When I turned 16, I came over to get it, and that was a good day. Now, what I'm about to tell you is something that you're not supposed to do. And Isaac, who's just my son, who's just about starting to drive, don't do this, all right? Or you young drivers, don't do this. But that car was great, except I had a, a, a strained relationship with that car and my trust. Because the brakes didn't quite work. When you stepped on the brakes, the caliper would hold on to the brakes and stop it, but it wouldn't let go. It wouldn't let go. So I came over the pass and I drove that car from Richland, Washington, all the way to Ephrata using the emergency brake. <laughs> Thankfully, my dad was in front of me, so if I crashed, it was into him. But yeah, crazy, crazy, crazy. Giving's a little like that. It's like that. But the problem is, is that God isn't the one to lose trust in. He's the one that's trustworthy. It's me. I'm the one with jacked up brakes. I'm the one that is going in to do stuff and things that I don't have a way to stop. And so I don't know if you're a new person to Jesus or you are you don't understand why we give or what... Uh, 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 this giving thing is all about, I'm here to tell you, there's financial advisors, secular financial advisors that might tell you things like, it's a tax write-off, it's good to give to charity, on and on and on. I don't do it for those reasons. I do it because I know what I'm like, and I need to remind myself that I've got to trust God. Trust God with the finances that he's given me, and by giving that, it's a way of saying, I'm going to trust you. I'm going to trust you to go with the 90% farther 
than I could do with 100% myself. I sometimes need solutions that are not of this world, and it's a way to do that. So would you, I'm going to pray and just ask us, God, help us with trust. Would you consider trusting God with your finances? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, help us. Help us. We all have broken breaks. We head, go straight headlong into, into sin, into the things that we do. And God, simple things like giving is a way for us to remind ourselves that, God, we're going to trust you. We're going to trust you with our relationships. We're going to trust you with our money. We're going to trust you with our lives. And even if it to a, a, a sacrifice, Lord, we're going to trust you. I pray your blessing over this offering, wherever it goes and what it does. We trust you with it in Jesus' name. Amen. My name is Susan Hesworthy. They call me Sue. And I've been going to church since I was a little girl through foster care and everything like that. And then um, I was in an abusive relationship for 12 years. And nine of those years, I lived with him in New York State. It was a dark time for me. He was very abusive and verbally abusive, not physically abusive. My um, boyfriend wanted to move to Washington State because he didn't want to live in New York anymore and I was like not wanting to go and I didn't want to give up my independence. I wanted to stay independent but I went and when I went an incident happened with him in my brother's home where he disrespected my brother and two young girls stuck up for me and they were my heroes because I couldn't stick up for myself and um that he was really battering me. And um, in God's way, he helped me escape with my brother's help, my sister-in-law, Christina, and Kayla and Lila, the two girls that helped me out that night. Then I went for a walk. And when I went for a walk, there was a neighbor lady walking in the neighborhood and we got to talking about Jesus. She's like, well, I have this church that I go to every Sunday and I'm like, I'm there. So we went and I've been coming ever since, ever since that day. And it's still, everything's like brand new, like shiny new, like a present every day. Every Sunday I come here, it's like a new story that I learned, and God was there the whole time, and I never seen it coming. <laughs> I love that line. God was there the whole time, and I never saw it coming. Thanks for that story, Sue. It's amazing, amazing. Hey, my name is Micah, and I'm excited to hang out with you for the next little bit. I am a guest, like Ellis said, from out of town. Got to hang out with the men this weekend, and you have an incredible group of men in this church. So, uh, yeah, come on, give it up. I'm sure the ladies are incredible too. I just didn't get to meet you, so I'm gonna break on the guys, okay? So, no, it was, a, it was an incredible weekend. Thanks for the opportunity to be here. And I'm excited to share with you today. Uh, I wanna to introduce you to a couple people real quick. This is my family, and the reason I wanna introduce you is because right now, they're praying for you because they know that God has something for you this, this day. Uh, this is Erica, my wife, my oldest, Tayton, my middle, Maxon, and then uh, a bunch of years later, God gave us a little miracle baby. Her name is Jojo. And uh, she is, I, I refer to her as uh, Sweet Spice. Because uh, she's got the sweet and she has got the spice. And uh, it's a lot of fun. But we, uh, we love our family and live over in the Tri-Cities. I told the guys on Friday night, if you wonder what the Tri-Cities look like, uh, take this weekend Erase everything that you can see that's green, but keep the sun. And that's, uh, that's the Tri-Cities. Uh, literally a, a, a dry, hot place, and I love it. And so, uh, but fun to get to be here with you this weekend. One of the things that no one told me about parenting. So, like, I, I've parented, and, like, midway through parenting, we hit the reset button. Because we, we had the two boys, and Maxon was six. My middle was six years old. And we were out of diapers. Like, they knew how to tie their own shoes. When it was time to go to the store, it's like, hey, everybody, let's go. And they would go. 
And then we had a baby again. And we're like, oh man, back into the diapers. You've got to do everything for them. But one of the things no one warned me about was the difference between having a boy and having a girl. Night and day difference. My boys taught me about Star Wars. I was, I like had seen Star Wars growing up, but I was more of an outdoorsy kid than an indoorsy, um, you know, there's a word for them, but people who like Star Wars, right? Um, so that, that just wasn't me. And so my boys taught me about Star Wars and stuff, but my daughter has now educated me about Disney princesses and all of the, yeah, there you go. Uh, all of the things. And I'm like, I, there's a whole world that I literally didn't know about. A whole just, just thing. But one of the things that no one warned me about is how many stories and movies that as a parent you get in the middle of, but then for some reason it gets interrupted and you have no idea how the story ends, right? Like you're in the middle of a book. But it's dinner time, so the daughter's like, all right, I'm done, climbs off my lap, and she's gone, right? Middle of the movie, but it's bedtime, and, and they're good with it because they know how the book ends. They're good with it because they know how the movie ends. Meanwhile, I'm going to bed as someone, when I watch movies, I'm not just like an observer from the outside. I'm like caught up in the movie, right? Like I'm like, don't talk to me because I am in the movie right now. Like I am experiencing it like I'm there. So I'm going to bed going, what happens to Mirabel's house, <laughs> right? Does it crack open? Does it fall apart? Does Luke ever rejoin the resistance? Like what happens in the rest of the story? Because you don't know how it ends. But it's really embarrassing when your kids come down in the middle of the night and you're finishing their Disney movie, right? So like <laughs> you, can't, you can't do that. You're stuck in between. Well, here's the reality. As frustrating as it might be to be in the middle of a story or the middle of a movie and not know how it ends, one of the experiences that you are guaranteed in life is to be in the middle of something that you don't know how it ends. To be in the middle of an experience where, where your life, right, the middle of the middle or in between, as we're going to call it, is that space and time between losing your last job and finding out what your next job is going to be. It's that space and time between the diagnosis and the doctor's game plan and the resolution. It's that space and time between orders and deployment and getting home, right? That's what it feels like to be in between. And as frustrating as it is in a movie, it can be a really desperate place to be as a follower of Jesus as a human. So today, what we're going to look at is a story from the Bible of someone who was in between and learn from them. What do we do when we're in between? Because it is a space where you are guaranteed to be. It's a space where you are guaranteed to find yourself. And if you're there today, I'm confident scripture has great news for us when we're in between. Because being in between is a very stuck place to feel. When, uh, when uh, I was a parent, so I'm trying to think, I don't even know what year it was, but my kids were growing and we had visited my mom and dad's house and my mom and dad have this porch with a cast iron railing on it. You know, the black twisty cast iron railing and we were inside visiting, the kids are outside playing, having a good time when all of a sudden, like all through the neighborhood, you just hear screams and not like the, my brother pushed me scream, more like the, I think I broke my leg kind of scream. My son is just like screaming. So all of us adults run outside to see what's happening. And here is what we found when we got outside. <laughs> He's stuck, right? Well, my dad is a firefighter, so I'm like, dad's got this, right? So we try everything. We're like, He's grabbing a pole, I'm grabbing a pole, we're like trying to pry it open, but it's cast iron, right? Like I think a lot of myself, but there was no way I was even gonna help that budge. I'm like, get out the Crisco, we're gonna <laughs> grease up his head, pull real hard. There was one point where I was like, let's just twist your head a little bit this way and maybe it'll come through. And he's like, ow, right? He's just like screaming. Well, what had happened was, we didn't realize it, but, but he didn't get his head through he got his feet and his hips and his shoulders through and his head couldn't finish the journey. So all we had to do was kind of hit the rewind button, get his shoulders and his hips and his feet back out and he was free. But in your life and in mine, when we're stuck in between, there's no rewind button. And as much as we want it, there's no fast forward button. And actually, you know what? I think here's what we're going to learn today. That it is God's grace 
that we don't have an undo button for our in-between seasons. Because there is something that's developed in your life when you are in between that often isn't developed in any other season. And things that are necessary to your life. I don't know if you've ever had the kind of injury where you had to do rehab. Uh, But if you're a physical therapist, we love you, but we don't like coming to see you. Because it's embarrassing to go to rehab and be like, okay, lift your shoulder like this. And you're like, I can't can't do it, right? Like I had a shoulder repair. And afterward, my, my physical therapist is like, okay, just like take this pencil and lift it up. And I'm like, that's embarrassing. It's embarrassing to be told to lift one pound and to struggle to do it. I had back surgery in my 20s, and my, my rehab after back surgery was for, for five days, I wasn't allowed to move. I just laid in the recliner on some medications that didn't let me, <laughs> didn't let me move. And my first day of rehab at my house was, okay, get up, walk around the coffee table, and then sit down for another eight hours. And it was hard. Like, it actually challenged me to do that. But here's what's happening is in that moment, There are tiny little muscles and ligaments and tendons in your body that need to be strengthened in order for your life to work. And rehab is that moment where those tiny little muscles and tendons and ligaments that don't get strengthened any other time are getting strengthened. And I think in our lives, in our in-between season, that's what Jesus is doing. He's growing some of those muscles and those tendons and those ligaments in our soul that our life needs in order to live into the fullness of life that he has planned for us, which means this, that your in-between season matters. What you do with your life when you're in between is not like, hey, it would be good to, no, it is essential. What God does in your life in between is essential. Like I said, the scriptures have good news for us. There's a guy named Paul and he wrote this in Philippians chapter one. Verse six, six, he said, I am certain. And I love that he used that word because certainty is exactly what I lack when I'm in between. When I'm in between, there is all questions and no answers. (laughs) But Paul comes on the scene writing from prison Like he has been arrested for preaching the gospel. He's in prison and he has the audacity to write to people. And I am certain. Like Paul was in between, but he was certain that God who began the good work within you will continue his work until it's finally finished on the day when Christ Jesus returns. Here's the good news for you today, that God who works in you, he never quits in between. He never quits in between. You might be going, God, I don't know what you're doing, but you can be confident of this. He is still working when you feel in between. So whether you're in between today or you just know, like me, that there will be other in-betweens in your life, how do we live when we are in between? We're going to look today at a story from Scripture straight from the life of Jesus and one of his closest followers named Peter. Peter is probably the most written about character in the Gospels other than Jesus himself because Peter, um, you, you've heard the phrase, a man of few words. That's not Peter. Okay? He's, he's the opposite of that. He's one that loves to blurt out. He was a leader type, A type personality on the disc assessment. He was a high D. Like he was, if he was going to be there, he was going to be in charge. And that's Peter. And Peter had these experiences with Jesus. So often you see Peter and he's either the first to get it right or the first to get it wrong. And rarely is he in between. <laughs> He's either way off getting corrected by Jesus or he's getting applauded because he was the first to say the right thing about Jesus. But Peter has this really interesting interaction that happens with Jesus right around the crucifixion. So Jesus uh, is at the height of his popularity there in the festival, the Passover festival in Jerusalem, and Jesus is the talk of the town. Everyone's hearing about the miracles and the teaching and all of this stuff, including the religious leaders who are like, we've got to snuff this out. So they make a plan to arrest Jesus. And the night before Jesus is arrested, he pulls his followers together and they have the Passover feast. They eat what we refer to as the Lord's Supper together. 
And here's what Jesus has to say to his disciples that night. Matthew chapter 26 says, Tonight, all of you will desert me. For the scriptures say God will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I have been raised from the dead, I will go ahead of you into Galilee and meet you there. Peter declared, even if everyone else deserts you, I will never desert you. He had such confidence. But Jesus went on to say, Peter, tonight before the rooster crows in the morning, you will deny three times that you even knew me. And that's exactly how the story played out. Peter follows Jesus after he gets arrested to the religious leader's house where they're trying Jesus in the middle of the night. Someone says, hey, you, you were with Jesus. I saw you. He's like, I've never even seen the man in my life. I don't know him. And three times that night, Peter denies Jesus. And then literally after his third denial, the rooster crows. And the Bible says that Jesus looked over and he locked eyes with Peter. You can imagine with me how all of that vibrato and all of that, like, Jesus, I would die for you, turned inward on Peter in the form of shame, and he ran away. And it's striking to me, actually, you read the story of the crucifixion, and it says some things about who was there that day. It talks about Jesus' mother being there and some of the other women who followed Jesus and the, the apostle John was there because Jesus says to John, take care of my mother after I die. So you have a record of the people who were there at the crucifixion and noticeably missing is Peter. He's gone. He's hiding in his shame. And he enters into one of the most prominent and poignant in-between moments that we have recorded in history. I mean, Peter's been right in the middle of the Jesus story. He's been right in the middle of, of all of the good things that Jesus has done. He's been right in the middle of this, and yet he's absent. Mark chapter 16 says this, that on the day that Jesus was raised from the dead, there's some women who went to the tomb to finish preparing his body for burial, and they met an angel, and here's what the angel had to say to them. He said, don't be alarmed. You're looking for Jesus of Nazareth who was crucified. He isn't here. He's risen from the dead. Look. This is where they laid his body. Now, go tell his disciples, and I love this line, including Peter. The angel of God had a specific message. Hey, Peter, in your in-between, what you feel like is an end is just an in-between. What you feel like is an irrecoverable, an unrecoverable mistake is just an in-between, including Peter, that Jesus is going ahead of you to Galilee. You will see him there just as he told you before he died. And they go. The disciples, Peter, they go to Galilee and, and they wait for Jesus. And while they're waiting, here's what happens in John chapter 21. And this is where we're going to camp out today and see Jesus' reaction to this in-between moment in Peter's life. They're there. They're waiting for Jesus. And Peter says this, I'm going to go fishing. Now, Peter was a commercial fisherman before he met Jesus. And so this is probably more than like a, a pastime, like I'm going to go throw my line into the water and just sit there and ponder my thoughts. No, Peter's like, well, we need to do something. You know, I, I don't see Peter as the kind of guy who sat around a lot. He was a, he was a go-getter. And so he's like, well, let's go fishing. So they get in the boat. They go fishing. They, they, the disciples with him said, we'll come too. So they went out in the boat, but they caught nothing all night. At dawn, Jesus was standing on the beach, but the disciples couldn't see who he was. He called out, fellows, have you caught any fish? No, they replied. Then he said, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you'll get some. This, whether you realize it or not, is exactly the same scenario that happened when Peter met Jesus for the first time. Peter had been fishing and he caught nothing all night. Jesus said, throw the net on the other side. And the same thing that happened the first time they met, that Peter and Jesus met happens here. So they did and they couldn't haul in the net because there were so many fish in it. Then the disciple that Jesus loved, which <laughs> I love this, it's a reference to John, who's also the person writing this book, right? Like, I don't think, I don't think John's spiritual gift was humility. He's like, the disciple that Jesus loved said. But he says to Peter, 
It's Jesus. It's the Lord. And when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his tunic, for he'd taken it off for work. He jumped into the water and he headed to shore. The others stayed with him in the boat and pulled the loaded net to shore, for they were only about a hundred yards off from shore. When they got there, they found breakfast waiting for them, fish cooking over a charcoal fire and some bread. Bring some of the fish you just caught, Jesus said. So Simon Peter went aboard and he dragged the net to shore. There were 153 large fish, and yet the net hadn't torn. Now, come and have some breakfast, Jesus said. I love that line. Come and have some breakfast. Jesus knows what you need. See, I love uh, the story that comes from here, and you should read it this afternoon. John chapter 21. Be a great little follow-up to this, because Jesus and Peter have this exchange. Where after the three times that Peter had denied Jesus, Jesus reminds him three times of God's forgiveness and his call on his life, and he invites him back into that. But today I want to zoom in on that in between. The moment in between the failure and the restoration. This moment where Peter felt like my son Maxon with his head between the railing, just going, I don't know what to do with this moment. It's a moment that if you have not found yourself in, you will find yourself in. We all end up in between. And and I just want to encourage you, what you do with your in-between seasons matters. What you do when you're in rehab matters. The strength that God is bringing you by allowing this in-between season in your life will matter for the seasons to come. And so often I watch believers in Jesus hit this in-between season and they can't hit rewind and they can't hit fast forward, so they hit pause. And they act like their role in this in-between is just to wait until something changes. But God has a good plan for your in-between season. And it matters what you do. It's not just to be endured. He brought it to you for a reason. But if these things are going to be developed in you, if the things that God wants to grow in you are going to grow, and how much they grow depends on what you do with your in-between season. It depends on what you do. So two thoughts for you, and then we're going to wrap this up. Two things that we all have to do in our in-between season. Here's the first one. You have to focus on simple truth. Focus on simple truth. Why? Because when you're in between, there's a lot of things you don't know. (laughs) You don't know how it's going to work out. You're in the middle of the movie. The beginning of the movie, there's all this wonder and intrigue. Like, oh man, I wonder what's going to happen. At the end of the movie, especially in America, like we tie up all the loose ends and it's all pretty and it wraps up and it's good. But the middle is where there's more questions than answers. And so often we can let what we don't know cloud our vision for the things that we do know. Do you feel stuck in between? You feel caught in between the the beginning and the end of the story and you don't know where you're at or how it's going to go? Here's my encouragement to you. Focus on simple truth. I mean, think about this. Think about all that Peter didn't know right now. (laughs) What happens next? Like, I didn't see that coming. Peter never thought that Jesus would be crucified until he saw it with his own eyes. He told Jesus the night before he he was betrayed. He's like, I wouldn't let that happen to you as if he was in control. (laughs) Jesus, don't worry. We got your back. We're not going to let him get you. But then all these things that Peter thought he knew were shattered. And that's being in between. But in the middle of that, what you have to do, and, and consider what Peter doesn't know about the future, right? He doesn't know that God's going to establish the church through him. He doesn't know that he's going to be a key player in the next chapter of the story. When Jesus is gone, people are going to look to Peter. And he has no idea. There is so much that he doesn't know. But what I love about what you see in the life of Peter is rather than on focusing what he doesn't know, he focuses on what he does know. Consider some things that you can know when you're in between. We've already read it once, but Philippians chapter one, verse six, this is true of your life, that I am certain that God who began the good work within you will continue his work until it's finally finished on the day when Jesus returns. If you feel in between, this verse is for you. That you can be certain that your God does not stop in between. 
He never stops in the middle of a story. He never has and he never will. I love it. He goes on to say, Paul says another place in Romans chapter 8. I am convinced. Again, notice the language. Convinced. Sure of. He is absolutely certain, right? There are things that can be known when you're in between. I am convinced that nothing could ever separate us from God's love. Not death, not life. Not angels, not demons, not our fears for today, nor our worries about tomorrow, not even the powers of hell could separate us from God's love. And then he goes on to say this in 2 Timothy chapter 1. This, that is why I'm suffering here in prison. He's referring to the good news of the gospel. But I'm not ashamed of it, for I know the one in whom I trust. And I am sure, like circle that with a highlighter, Right? that he is able to guard what you have entrusted to him until the day of his return. So here's the truth about your in-between seasons. You can let what you don't know haunt you, or you can let what you do know hone you. But one of those things will happen. (laughs) You will either be haunted by all of the questions that don't have answers, or you will stand on the sure foundation of what you do know and let the things that God is growing in you be shaped. So focus on simple truth. Like what you learned in Sunday school matters for these seasons, right? Maybe you didn't go to Sunday school growing up. Just like Spotify children's Christian songs, okay? And listen to the truths in there and let it reverberate in your heart. Because Jesus loves me, this I know, carries weight when you're in between. Like, that's like, I don't know, oh man, there's a, uh, a children's Bible called the Jesus Storybook Bible. I don't know if you've ever seen it. But there's been seasons of my life where I feel stuck in between and I'm reading that to my kids at night and it's a children's Bible. And I'm like weeping <laughs> because the truth is jumping off those pages is something I needed to hear. When you feel stuck in between, go back to the foundational truths that you know, that Jesus loves you. That God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. That you can be convinced that he who started a good work in you will not stop in the middle, but he will bring it to completion at the day when Christ Jesus returns. Come back to those foundational truths of scripture when you feel stuck in between. Here's the second thing. And again, I'm going to use the word simple. But I get this. It's simple, but it's not easy. (laughs) Choose simple obedience. Don't let the things that you don't know what you're supposed to do keep you from doing the things that you do know what to do. You might not know which jobs to apply for or which house to pick or which spouse God has for you. You might not know how that deployment or that diagnosis is going to end, but focus and come back to the truth of what you do know. Like just get out and love your neighbor. (laughs) When you feel stuck in between, ask yourself, what does it look like to love God and do that? (laughs) I'm going to be honest with you. Following Jesus isn't always crystal clear. Like there is so much that we don't know all of the ins and outs of how to do it. But we don't help ourselves either (laughs) because we take some of the simple things and we make them complicated. I loved the my story that Sue told today because she talked about just being out in a neighborhood, going for a walk when she happened into a conversation with a neighbor lady who ended up talking about Jesus. Man, I pray that's my neighborhood conversations. Let's just chat and Jesus is going to come up because he's that much a part of my life. Right? Don't let what you don't know, what you don't know to do in your in-between seasons, keep you from simple obedience. I love the New Testament where it says this, to, to know the good thing to do and not do it, that's sin. Because I think so often we complicate it, self. we complicate it, we, we, we let what we don't know keep us from the simple, basic, foundational truths that we don't know. Here's the truth. You'll be tempted to let what you don't know keep you from trusting those things that you do know. You see this in the story of Peter. Jesus says, hey, Peter, uh, when I rise from the dead, go ahead and meet me in Galilee. Well, that's like me being like, hey, on Tuesday, meet me in eastern Washington, right? You're like, where? <laughs> eastern Washington's not exactly a small place. 
Galilee is an entire state. Like it's, a, it's an entire region in Israel. So Jesus says, hey, Peter, go ahead and meet me in Galilee. And where do Peter and the disciples go? They go to Galilee. But here's the truth about it. Don't miss this. They don't know where Jesus is. They don't know where in Galilee they're supposed to meet Jesus. They don't know where the the rendezvous point is. They don't know where X marks the spot. But when they don't know where Jesus is, he knows right where they are. That's true about you where you're at today. You might feel stuck in between and you might be going, Jesus, I don't know where you're at in this. He knows right where you are. And he will use this in-between season to grow muscles and ligaments and tendons in you that can't be grown in any other season. So do not despise your in-between. When you feel stuck in between, don't shake your fist at God. Don't let it turn into shame or anger or all of those emotions that are so familiar to us as humans. But trust, God, when I don't know where you are, you know right where I am. So a couple months after that back surgery I had, I'd been doing rehab and I got to the point where I was walking around the house and then walking around the block and then I was feeling pretty good about life. Like I I felt like I was back to normal. Three months later, my friends were like, hey, we're going to play basketball. I'm like, yeah, let's go, right? Because I'm back to normal. I felt good. I hadn't really run yet, but I'm like, I'll take it easy, right? I'll just be like the passer, the rebounder. Like I'm going to be really, really careful. But I got past the ball and there's no one in front of me. So I'm like, it's game time. Let's go, right? That's the high school athlete in me is like, come on. It's your moment to shine. Pick up basketball game. Totally worth it. So I start driving down the driving down the court and there's one guy in front of me so I go to juke him and my knee was like nope and just <laughs> game over sublocated my kneecap where your kneecap goes like over here sorry for the visual had to go there <laughs> I felt like God was like hey since you're not smart enough I'm going to make this decision for you right <laughs> But what had happened was, during my rehab, I had done the right things. Like, I'd gone on my walks, started lifting light weights, done all the right things. But those little things in me that needed to be grown and developed and strengthened weren't there yet. And I tried to move on to the next season before my middle was done. Can I just encourage you, when you feel stuck in the middle, don't try to rewind. And don't try to fast forward because God has you there for a good reason. Like his intentions for you, they are always good. So let God do in the middle what he wants to do in your life. Trust that even when I'm in the middle and I hate it here, I'm uncomfortable, I'm confused. I can't see your good plan, God. I don't see where this road goes and that scares me. Trust that when I'm in the middle, you know right where I am. I take a lot of comfort in John chapter 21, verse nine, when it says this. Peter jumped in the water. The disciples followed him coming into shore. And it says, when they got there, they found breakfast waiting for them. Fish cooking over a charcoal fire and some bread. Do you know how long it takes for wood to become charcoal? You know how long it takes to make bread and fry fish? This means that when they had no idea that Jesus was on shore, he was already getting something ready for them that they had no idea about. He was preparing something for them when they felt lost and alone and discouraged and in between. See, while they were waiting, he was working on their behalf. Here's what you got to know about your in-between. God is not far from you. He's working for you. (laughs) You might be going, God, where you at? Because if you were here, you would have never let this happen. He's making you breakfast. 
He is preparing something to sustain you. And while you're waiting, while you're going, God, can we hurry up and get through this? Because I hate it. He's working for you. You have no idea where God is. He knows right where you are. He's never lost sight of you for a second. So today, here's my question for you. Are you in between? If you might be, there's good news for you. Focus on simple truth and choose simple obedience. But if you're not in between today, can I give you a little heads up? You're about to be. (laughs) I don't know what it is. I don't know what's coming your way. But this is a regular pit stop in the journey of life. (laughs) You will find yourself in between. Don't reach for the remote and hit rewind or fast forward. Focus on simple truth. Choose simple obedience. Because see, here's what happens. Peter, right, for the next 50 days, Jesus and Peter are going to see each other. The Bible says that they, Jesus appeared to his disciples repeatedly and then he ascended to heaven. But Peter launches into a life that I can't imagine. Right in the middle of Jesus establishing his church, which still exists today. And Peter's like a prominent voice in this. He's one of the heroes that God uses to establish his church. And it doesn't happen if Peter gives up in between. It doesn't happen if Peter doesn't go to Galilee, even though he doesn't know where to find Jesus there. So don't give up on your in between. God's writing a really good story with your life. But it will require some in between moments. Focus on simple truth. Choose simple obedience and trust that while you're waiting, God is working. I want to pray for you today, and I'm going to pray two things. One, for those of you who are in between, that God, I love that you're in church this morning because this is exactly where you should be. You have friends here. You have pastors here who care about you and want to walk with you in this in between. But my second prayer is for all of us. If you're not in an in-between moment, knowing that it will come. And then when it comes, we as a people would choose simple truth. I'm going to focus on those things that I know because there's a lot of things I don't. And I'm going to choose. I'm going to live into simple obedience. Will you stand with me as we pray and close this out this morning? God, I'm so grateful that you are worthy of my trust, just like Ellis talked about this morning. You are worth my trust. And that's true of the good seasons where there is plenty, where I can see the future from here, where I see the story you're writing and how it all works together. And it is true of the foggy valley when I can't see two inches in front of my face. When I don't know the story you're writing or how it goes from here, God, you are still worthy of my trust. And I pray over those who are listening here today, God, over those who are watching online, that as we walk through our in-between, God, that we would not let all of the things that we don't know and all of the questions that we have keep us from choosing and focusing on those simple truths that are right in front of us, the foundational truths that remind us who you are. That we would not let all the things that we don't know to do keep us from those things that we do know we should be doing. But that we would choose to live into those simple things in between. For every person here, God, who's not in between. Maybe they feel like they're riding that mountaintop experience. Everything's good right now. It's all working together. God, I pray that you would prepare our hearts for those in-between seasons. And that when they come, we would come back to the simple truths and the simple obedience, trusting who you said you are, knowing God that when we have no clue where you are in it, that you know exactly where we are. With your heads bowed and eyes closed, I just wanna speak to one group of people who might be here this morning. Maybe you're here and you haven't decided to follow Jesus. You haven't decided to receive his forgiveness and his grace. And maybe you've listened to this this morning and thought, yeah, sure, that's for those people. 
That's for those people who got it all together, who, who they're a part of this church and they're following Jesus and, and they've already made these decisions. Of course that's for them. No, today, this is for you. You might have never thought of Jesus in your life. He knows right where you are. And he's been there the whole time. And this morning, he made you breakfast. He's inviting you to the fire to sit with him. And like he forgave and restored Peter, he longs to forgive and to restore you today. It's as simple as saying this, Jesus, I trust you with my heart. Please forgive me of my sins and help me to follow you. And that's the beginning of a beautiful journey. God wants to write an incredible story with your life, but it all starts with how will you respond today? Because he's made you breakfast and he's invited you to sit by him at the fire and to experience his forgiveness. If you made that decision this morning, I would encourage you to talk to one of the pastors here at True Grace or come find me, find a leader around here. They would love to pray with you, to encourage you and to invite you because we as a church family, this is all about walking together in our own journeys of following Jesus. And you are invited this morning. I hope you know this message was for you as well. Jesus, thank you that today people get to say yes to you. <laughs> that today your mercy is brand new, even this morning. That your forgiveness is still available to us. Jesus, help us to follow you through every season, even the in-betweens. We pray this in your name. Amen. Amen. Hey, it's been a privilege to be with you all weekend. God bless you. I hope you're back here next weekend and part of this church family. Have an incredible week.